You've been back to the States yeah. since you moved here. What yeah. kind of things did you suddenly think, well, that's odd? Um, I would say one of the biggest issues going back to the States, because I've been living abroad for so long, mm -hmm. I didn't have a car. Mm -hmm. And I like I didn't even have a driver's license at that point because it's just been so long. Mm -hmm. yeah. So mm -hmm. it becomes very clear that when a country doesn't invest in public transportation, how difficult it is for its to people get to get around. Yeah. Like here in Beijing, there's buses, there's subways, there's <laughs> there's bikes, there's all kinds of ways like, you know, have taxis and DDs and things like this. Um, going back to the United States, the first time I went back, um, Uber wasn't really a thing. So this was like mm. 2011, I think, when I first went back. Mm. And I didn't have a car because I had sold all my stuff to come to China because I was expecting to live in China for a year and then travel mm. through Asia for some period of time. Mm. Um, so I didn't really have anything. You don't have a parents. box at mom's? Yeah, I mean, I had a box, but it, it, didn't, it didn't have like a car in my box. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so when I got back, it was kind of like, oh, like it's really hard to get around. Um, mm. So that was a bit of reverse culture shock. The other thing that I noticed, because I'm not... Um, like, I'm not, like, super fluent in Chinese. Mm. And so I don't watch Chinese television. Mm -hmm. mm. So one of the things that I noticed when I got back, my parents watch television, is there's the amount of advertisement that people <laughs> that have in the United States <laughs> mm. is insane. Mm. Like, you'll have a, a, a hour show, but the show's actually only 30 minutes. So you'll have 30 Seven minutes, minutes yeah. of ads or something crazy. Like, it's just a ton of ads. And, like, for stuff, people don't even need, like, pills. It was all, like pills it was like no no you have to, it's a walking in the park with balloons and butterflies it's not a pill <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah of course of course right it's gonna make you be able to walk in the park yeah but like advertisement and like this is my industry also so like advertisement mm, and marketing mm. i think maybe i was more hyper aware of it because mm. i had been removed for a while mm. that i hadn't noticed like there's advertisement in china obviously mm, yeah mm, mm. but because i didn't watch chinese television like i didn't watch television here in china i never really noticed and like same in Europe, the way that they have their advertisements, oftentimes they're very short and they're very much like at the beginning Straight or the, to the end. Point. Yeah. yeah, but they're also like the way that they in, like, include them in a program, it's often like at the beginning and the end. Yeah. And so you might have like one ad break in an hour show, mm. it, but it'll be like, you know, maybe like a two minute ad break right in the middle. And then you have the, the first in the back. Same here wow. in China. You'll have that where you'll see the ad at the beginning. The show will play for quite some time yeah. and then you'll have an ad break. Yeah. As for in the United States, the ads were like every two minutes. Every, yeah. Every two really... minutes, you'd get a minute of ads. So you'd have two minutes of show, then you, a minute of ad, then two minutes of show. And then it's like, it's unwatchable. Have you seen the, <laughs> have you seen shows that were, you know, that started on network and then later moved on to Hulu hmm. and then you pay extra to remove the ads mm -hmm. on Hulu. And just get short. But then, <laughs> then it just becomes, yeah. you know, like three, five minutes of con content dips to black. Three, five minutes of content dip to black. Because mm -hmm. those are the original cuts. Yeah, mm -hmm. they add those in. Like that's yeah. the show actually adds mm -hmm. them in. And so paying extra to remove the ads almost become a little bit less friendly to the viewers. <laughs> so you just mentioned traveling to Europe. Mm -hmm. So do you also made videos about your tr European travels. Where did you go? What did you see? What did you like about Europe? I haven't made that many videos because I hadn't actually started that channel um, when I was traveling in Europe. Mm -hmm. But we arrived in oh, 2013, maybe is when we went there. And so we went to, um, we, we flew into Paris. And so we did some time in France. Then we went to, took a train to Belgium and spent a couple of days in the capital. You, you eat chocolate while you're there, yes. Yeah, of course, of course, right. <laughs> and, then, and then we went to the Netherlands and spent time with her family. Um, Got the approval. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, her father came to China and her mother came twice. What and my sister has China? come once. Yeah, what did they think about China? Yeah. That's a good question. Uh, her father, um, he's no longer alive, but when he came, um, he was blown away. He was like, <laughs> he doesn't, he couldn't speak very much English, but he wanted to have in-depth conversations with me <laughs> about all the things in China. And, um, he was like, whoa, they have all these sports cars. Cause he went down to like San Yes. And like, he saw all like the Ferraris and the Lamborghinis and the, <laughs> you know, Aston Martins and stuff. And he was just like, whoa, Who he was blown away. People? Yeah. He's like, I didn't know they had like these kinds of things. Like, well, what did you kind of expect? It's a, yeah. it's a, normal country <laughs> like everybody has this idea that china isn't normal and so why would they have these types of like luxury cars and i'm yeah. like actually that's like the biggest market for many of these brands is mm. now china mm. especially like luxury bags and handbags and like prada yes. and all this stuff um china's its biggest like that's mm. their biggest market yeah and so people don't realize that because they again they have this idea that it's like 1950s or like <laughs> 
1980s or something like come this weird mix like i was saying it's this weird mix of opinions and so when people come they just are like blown away. So can you tell us about what you want to share with your fans on Trip Bitten? So that is spelled T-R-I-P-B-I-T-T-E-N, Trip Bitten on YouTube. Mm. What is it that you're hoping to share with them in your travels to Malaysia and Laos and Japan and China, et cetera? Well, I, get, I think originally with like the travel style content, it was kind of twofold. One, just to show that you can do it. There's this kind of mentality in the United States, I think specifically, is that like the world is this big place and you can't really leave your mm. like your hometown. Like I know people that when I was saying that I was going to come to China, mm. they thought that was the craziest thing they'd ever heard. They're like, "What do you mean? <laughs> That's uh, you're, you're allowed? Like right? It's not yeah, even. Yeah, right. It's you're not even like to... why China is like. Why would you leave this country? <laughs> well, that, a lot of people have that mentality. I mean, mm. we're told since we're little that America's the greatest country in the world, and mm. so if you're in the greatest country in the world, why would you leave that? Right? And so. I think a lot of people are bought by, by, they buy into that idea because we're told from a little, like from a young age in school mm. and, and everything. And so when I would tell them that I was going to go, it was just such a strange concept to them. And so with the YouTube channel, I think part of it was just to kind of show people that, yeah, there's a bigger world. There's more happening in the world. Mm. Um, you don't have to live in your hometown forever. Like you can do other things. And then the other half of it was like also because I hadn't been, communicating all that often with my family and they do want to know what I'm up to. Mm. Mm. One way that you can show what you're up to is just by showing what you're That's up a, to, right? It's yeah, <laughs> like, this is where we are. This is what we're doing. And it's not like my family doesn't communicate. It's just like once, <laughs> once you get, well, you know, like yeah, a phone call can only go so far. Exactly. exactly. A, a zoom or a Skype. Skype was the thing back then. Now it's zoom, but that's like, you know, different time zones, different life. Yeah. To be honest, like it's just a different life. So sometimes, you know, you send an email and then you get a response or whatever. Mm. But like seeing it is very different. Yeah. It's a very visual, almost like um, immersive experience. Like you're mm. there with me traveling. Mm. And that was kind of part of the idea. So the twofold was kind of just to show that you could do other things. And then also for my family, because I knew that they were watching it, specifically my, my parents, because they traveled a lot when they were young. Mm. And so mm. they found it interesting. Hey, and your dad, he lived in China. No, no, he didn't live. He, he worked here for one summer. It was a mm, summer program. Mm. But he lived many other places um, during the 60s, 70s, and 80s. 60s and 70s, mostly. They traveled the world for about seven years, my parents. Wow. wow. Yeah. So they went. That's actually very unusual, especially for that time, I think, for a yeah, lot of Americans. Yeah. We always joke they were part of the CIA because they went, <laughs> they went places they shouldn't have gone, like Iran, right before it uh, mm. fell. And yeah. like, uh, they went, they went places that they, they, yeah, they went to Israel, they went to Iran, they went to um, Morocco and India. They went many places and they mm. were all down through South America mm. during times. <laughs> <laughs> During understood, that time, um, no, they, they, I, I don't think they were. But we'd always joke because they traveled so much; they were extensively like traveling. So, mm. so your time as an English teacher was very short, and then you ended up working mm -hmm. for a major oil exporter. Is that correct? Yep. And so you did marketing, mm -hmm. and so in what capacity? What was that like? How did how does marketing work in in that? arena mm. yeah so when i first came here like i said i was only going to stay for like a year or so i was like ah teaching job make a little bit of money on the side and then mm. go travel but once it became clear that i was going to stay in china like mm. longer term you wanted a then i was like well job. i want a professional job yeah, yeah mm. it makes sense because i studied marketing i didn't study mm. english like that's not my major and i'm not particularly good at teaching um so i said okay well how do i transition out of that into a professional job and I ended up landing a job at China National Petroleum, Zhongguo Shoyo, mm -hmm. which is the largest oil company in China. And they have lots of subsidiaries doing lots of different things from just like petro stations on the side of the road where you can just buy gas to uh, drilling in China and, and outside of China to lots of different like natural gas and all these different aspects of the petroleum industry. Mm. So I was working for a subsidiary that was doing drilling. And so we were... Uh, drilling company that would go to other countries and help drill. Um, mm -hmm. We also had projects in China, but because I was part of the international department, like the international marketing department, mm -hmm. I only focused on the international projects. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of that day to day was like any other business, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of paperwork and reports <laughs> and filing. Um, but the interesting like kind of aspect is because people don't really know a lot about it was um, 
we were drilling in many countries that were maybe difficult for American companies to enter uh, through sanctions, or they just found it difficult for um, them to operate in that mm-hmm. country. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. China would take a lot of these contracts, like Iran and like mm. Cuba and like Peru and Venezuela and places where Nigeria and places mm-hmm. like this, where it was more difficult or just American operators chose not to operate. And then you switched to publishing. And yeah. then also marketing, yes? Also marketing, yeah. So I, I, when I was at the oil company, I was in the international marketing department, and I was just a marketing coordinator. So I'd help mm. them with, like, trade shows and uh, day-to-day kind mm-hmm. of stuff because all the business is conducted in English because mm. it's international business. Mm. And so I'd help them with English stuff. I'd help them with contracts. I'd help them with trade shows and creating marketing content for mm. their mm. trade shows and whatever type of marketing stuff we'd put out. Um, advertisement and things like that. And so when I switched to China um, International Publishing Group, I ended up taking a management position. Mm-hmm. That's why I switched. So I was offered Makes a management sense. position mm-hmm. and more money. And, you know, it's a career. You know, that's what you do in a career. You move up, right? Yeah. Uh, I was told at the oil company that there wasn't a lot of growth opportunity for me. Like, mm. it's, you know, it's difficult, especially since I had only worked there for a, a short amount of time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there wasn't a lot of opportunity there as a foreigner in just because um, many people had worked there many years mm. who would be up for a promotion before mm. me. I mean, that's how, yeah. that's how these many organizations work, not just these. Um, and so I jumped ship because I got a, more money and a management position. And while I was there at that company, we were doing media. Mm-hmm. It's a publishing group. And I was a manager of one of the brands. So China International Publishing Group is like the parent company, and then they have a lot of different mm. brands mm. underneath them that do video. We were mostly mm. doing video. Um, we also did some uh, articles, but our main focus was video. I was making a video the other day on my own channel, and I, I made the the comparison. 770 million people mm. is like bringing two and a half Americas out of poverty. Mm. Yeah, like exactly. all Americans. Mm. Yeah. Like it, you can't understand that if you don't actually think about it. And so a lot of times these videos would try and make those points mm. Mm. and people just didn't understand it. Like, what do you mean half a million people in this area are <laughs> now pulled out of poverty? Like mm. they mm. don't even live in a city of half a million people. So they don't un- like True. the concept is so foreign. And then poverty is also very foreign to like the United States, because poverty in the United States is like you might make $20,000 a year, right? Or 15 to $20,000, that's Mm. poverty. You're gonna struggle in the United States. But poverty in China, you might be only making like two or 3,000 US dollars a year. And now that's increased two or three times fold. Like it'd be like if you took somebody in the United States and and they increased their income from 20,000 to like 70,000 a year. Like, if you did that, they would be like, this is the most amazing thing (laughs) that's ever happened. My life has absolutely changed. Hmm. But if you say, oh, we've moved from $1,000 or Mm -hmm. $2,000 a year to $8,000, they're like, oh, that's nothing. $8,000, you're still poor. Hmm. It's because they don't understand, like, how money works within, like, this culture. Because they only have a reference point of your own culture and your own society. So they're saying, oh, they're making $8,000. That's nothing. Hmm. Right. And so then, then, so like that was like one of the hardest things when you're making this type of content yeah. is how do you get a foreign audience to actually understand what we're talking yeah. about? Yeah. Because like our, like when we put the same content out on Chinese platforms, mm. it would do very well. Millions mm-hmm. of views of and, and people understood it and they'd like and be like, oh, that's such a great piece. It's such an yeah. interesting story. Put it out on YouTube or Facebook or wherever <laughs> else we were posting it. And people, if they did watch it, which oftentimes they didn't just because yeah. it wasn't an interest to them. But if they did watch it, then they'd be like confused. The comments would be like, I don't get it. Or like, you know, something else like mm. like that. Like, mm. oh, well, they're still poor. Or something. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, but. <laughs> and you, you transition from this to focusing on your YouTube channel full time. Mm. So you, this is kind of a continuity of mm. work, marketing marketing yeah. and the youtube channel is kind of also marketing you're marketing your tra- travels yeah. you're marketing yeah. Yeah. yeah um yeah i mean with that is um my contract ended with that um company mm. and i had just gone through the start of the pandemic my contract ended in 20 let me think 2020 like in August. Mm -hmm. Mm. So we had just gone through this media push that 
I didn't necessarily agree with and my contract was coming to an end and because of just everything that was happening, it was a stressful time for a lot of people. And of there was a lot of, of like this wolf warrior kind of mentality on Twitter. And China was pushing this, this, we have won, we beat COVID, like we, we're the best country in the world. And I was thinking, mm, give it some time. Um, <laughs> we'll see. Um, and so my contract was ending. I didn't necessarily want to work there anymore. And they didn't necessarily want me there anymore because it was just kind of like, I had gotten burned out doing mm -hmm. that type of content for four years. And like a lot of it I can get behind and I can understand the angle and the reasoning for the piece of content. But for four years trying to push out content and not making the changes that I wanted within mm. the company mm -hmm. um, to make the content better for an uh, international audience, it had gotten to the point where I was just like, I don't want to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. And so luckily my wife works full time and I was able to get a dependent visa through my wife, mm. uh, which would allow me to stay here mm. um, in China, which obviously at that point in time, nobody wants to leave. I mean, China was um, the safest place at that point in time, right? Mm. I mean, it's still technically the safest place, yep. um, has the, low, like, the least amount of COVID in based on population and everything. Um, but so we weren't going to move. So I got a dependent visa because my wife had just gotten a promotion at her work and she was happy. And so mm -hmm. I said, okay, well, what can I do? And uh, that's when I decided to focus specifically on her channel. Like I said, at the beginning, I said mm -hmm. I focused on her channel doing the 10 years in, mm -hmm. in China series. And so I was like, well, your channel has more subscribers. So let's push. And I was like, I like filming you because <laughs> you're my wife and I love you. Right? Everything's Aww. great. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think she's really pretty, I, you know obviously. Um, <laughs> so I was like, oh, you would be great as a host. Let me do all the back end. Let me do the filming. Let yeah. me do the editing. And all you have and to you do produce is, her. yeah. And I was going to be, yeah, be pretty and fun. <laughs> and I can even write your scripts so that you have an idea of what you're yeah. saying. Well, we did that, like I said, and it did really well on her channel, but basically it was kind of like a uh, top 10 reasons type list. Like it was mm -hmm. like, like top, nice. top 10 reasons I love living in China, top 10 favorite yeah. Chinese foods, these kinds of things. And those videos can do very well and they did do very well, but she got tired of it mm. because she's like, well, there's no creativity. It's just kind of, the, it's just like yeah. a list. And mm. I was like, yes, but it's working. So let's just keep doing it. And mm. then she's like, but I don't want to do it. And so then mm. that fell apart. And that's when I decided, okay, well, I could start focusing on my own. If you manage yourself. Channel. If I manage myself and I write my own scripts, then I know. I wouldn't know. disagree with myself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's like, kind of. What I, a brilliant <laughs> idea, me. Uh, I'm great. Wow, I look really I, good on camera. <laughs> and then I put it out and people are like, this sucks. I'm like, oh. oh. oh you have tw <laughs> like 21,300 subscribers? Yeah, 21,000 um, subscribers. And, uh, you know, that's grown recently. I had a video that did really well. Mm. And so. I got a lot of new subscribers recently. Hmm. And um, so I'm just going to kind of keep going down that path. I'm doing my 12 years in China series now. So I'm kind of mm. working on that. Nice. And well, I figure if it worked well for her, it should work well for me. It sounds um, like you know what you're doing a lot better than me because you have more followers on YouTube than I do. <laughs> but I mean, you are living in Beijing. Couldn't you do like just Yunming Yuan? And then you could do a diff different like district or like hutongs one day it's like hey this is cool. yeah and i think that might work really well on chinese social media because mm. people generally have again, an interest in context, that yeah. but again it, going back to like the poverty alleviation and stuff mm. if if there's no interest in in it mm. um then it doesn't matter how well it's produced yeah people are like what's people, a hutong what are you talking yeah, about yeah people won't watch it regardless yeah. of how well it's produced because i've seen some fabulous videos on youtube mm. and i watch it and i'm like wow this is really great and you go and you look and they have no subscribers. Views. Yeah. Or they have no views. And you're like, oh, you know, but the topic itself isn't interesting. Mm. Or the way the information is presented isn't interesting. Marketing. So. Absolutely. You got to know your audience. You got to know the targeted yes. group. Yes. And so one of the things that I've found with like the Chinese space, like I was talking about earlier, is there's kind of the anti-China and then there's kind of the kind of pro-China mm. people who live here who kind of tell a different side of China. And I guess you could classify them as pro because most of them aren't critical. Mm -hmm. um, and you, so- Are you familiar with Jerry Gray? Yes. We had him on the program and he, one of the things that he said was, this is just what I see. You know, like yeah. this yeah. is the, yeah. I, the, my experience. The, you, yeah. Your words from earlier. Right, that's that's the thing. It is like our, our experiences, but it appears pro mm -hmm. because we're not- saying China is this terrible place like the other, <laughs> the other YouTubers right so the other YouTubers that are very popular are media groups like even now there's the WINO from India I think it's mm. and they're 
they're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> they're really, they're really negative to China. And like, so oh, okay. like there's a lot of that content out there. So it's kind of, you end up in one or two camps. The only person that I know that has done really successful that hasn't really been in one of the two camps is Amy from Blondie in China. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, she lives here in Beijing, met her many times and mm. I know her and like, but she does food videos. Mm. So mm. I could go out and do food videos. Like you're saying, go to different areas yeah. and try yeah, different yeah. foods, but I don't eat meat. So <laughs> hey, there are a lot of uh, uh, vegan self media influencers that are doing really well. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe what is the maybe vegan population of, of the of like yeah. the US or Europe? Like, yeah. it's like 10 percent, 5 percent. I don't know. I'm just know. making that up. Right. But then again, it's a very small audience. So like yeah. if you're going to eat Chinese food, you got to eat Chinese food. Yeah. Right. you got to eat the 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 noodles or the big leg leg. yeah like i'm I'm trying to think of fire yeah yeah. yeah. and so like those are the things that you need to if you want to make it interesting like the food ranger who used to live in china before he moved to malaysia like he used to do all that does he have a big hat just i used the word ranger i'm like (laughs) (laughs) brim hat (laughs) funny jason yeah this word popped into my mind he's a ranger he's gonna have a big hat and a badge no (laughs) yeah i'm here to inspect your food It gets the approval. Um, no, but he, he's, yeah, he was here in China a long time ago and lived in China, Did became popular, got his first million subscribers doing that type wow. of food wow. stuff. And then he went to Thailand because his wife, I believe, is from Thailand and then did Thai food for a while and then mm. he was in Malaysia. And then recently he's been like in Pakistan and other places. Mm. And so like there are, there are opportunities. There are people that do like that type of like food video, mm. but you have to be willing to, actually eat that and you have to actually know food true like, you can't just be like this tastes really good <laughs> <laughs> because I've, I've i've we've done food videos in the past my wife and i and then you watch them again you're like all we were saying is wow oh my this God, is really wow. great mm, mm, so yeah. good. it's so good it tastes great <laughs> and then and then we're like what does it taste like and we're like uh like pork yeah you aren't really yeah, like? if you aren't really <laughs> describing it and really going into detail and really yeah. getting like the perfect shots yeah. that type of content seems easy on the surface but it actually, really not. it's not. Yeah, yeah like mm. those food vloggers, actually, they have to understand their audience also, mm. like yeah. and what they yeah. actually want to see and, and set up the story of why are they eating this food? Why is it important? It's a whole story. Like the history of that yeah, food. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Like the, and, and the ones that do it well, do it well, mm. <laughs> right? Uh, but a lot of people don't. And so that's yeah. with YouTube, like with anything. There's tons of YouTubers out there mm-hmm. right now mm-hmm. who are in China who just you probably don't know about them because they mm. only have like four or 500 subscribers, mm. right? Mm. They're not doing it well. Mm. And the only reason you found me was because I was able to do it a little bit better than some of the others. Cause you're right? a marketing professional. Well, <laughs> I mean, to some extent, right? Yeah. I mean mm. like I've been able to grow multiple YouTube channels and like there's, there's steps and there's processes that you mm. have to do in order to actually get them bigger. Mm. And unfortunately, like I don't, necessarily have like the dedication to really truly push it Mm. like because like the ones that do really well are weekly uploads with shorts in between and like they're really on it making a lot of content Mm. and that takes a lot of time so right now i'm focused on my life in china and kind of my opinions on china because i can't travel as much Mm -hmm. so i'm going to start kind of just kind of opinionated pieces, kind of what I think about China. Mm-hmm. And because of I have experience here, so I feel mm-hmm. that gives me some authority. Mm-hmm. Plus, I've worked mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. Chinese, like, state-run companies, like China National Petroleum is a state-run company. Yeah. And mm-hmm. China International Publishing Group is a state-run company. Yeah. Like, so there are parts of my story that are different than, say, just an English teacher yeah. who shows up and eats food. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, uh, sorry, English. No, but, <laughs> but, but, you know what I'm saying? So there are different aspects that I feel like I can actually talk on these subjects mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm, a little bit mm-hmm. more because, yeah, because of my experience. personal experience yeah. exactly. and so that's kind of the direction that i'm going to try and focus until possibly traveling in the future again um, but would you consider moving to other regions of the world or are you going to use china as your base of operations mm. right now my wife and i has i've have been having the debate about whether or not we're going to stay in china mm-hmm. and so we've been here for 12 years um and that's a you know you get settled in Mm -hmm. yeah and you get comfortable where you live Mm -hmm. and so making the jump to move is is a big decision Mm -hmm. like if we've been here for like a year all your friends connections networking networking the lifestyle lifestyle and work Mm -hmm. like my like i said my wife got a promotion which is why Mm -hmm. when we were kind of thinking of possibly leaving then she got a promotion so it's like well okay we can stay a little bit longer Mm -hmm. and now her contract is going to end in like not next summer, so about two 
two years from now, 2024, mm-hmm. her contract will end. And so we have to make a decision in the next couple of months because they're, the work is asking what her decision is going to be. Is she going to re-sign a contract or not? Um, so we have to make a decision on where we're going to be and what we want to do. We haven't made it yet, but I'm sure, like yourself, you've been living here under the situation. Um, <laughs> well, I love it here. Personally, I'm going <laughs> to retire here. That's my right. plan. I just got to make sure there's a couple bridges in my pension because hmm. if, <laughs> if the, you miss a month, it might affect your yeah. pension. Really? So I have to go back and make sure that those are filled. Oh, oh, okay. And then I, when I retire, I Here's get pension and oh, I'm going to oh. be like... Yes, I'm okay. going to stay home and take... It's not a lot of money, but it's enough it's to enough. like cook yeah. food at home and watch TV. So I'm going to be like, yes, it's my, ter- it's my turn to watch TV, Mom and Dad. Right. <laughs> I mean, I, I, think, I think... Yeah, I mean, I think everybody's situation is a little different. Yeah. So with yeah. my wife and I, seeing that we don't have any family here, you do, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. that makes a big difference. Yeah, I think mm-hmm. so. Um, so her family is in the Netherlands. My family is in yeah. the United States. We haven't seen them in over three years. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so there are aspects that make us question how long we're going to stay. Well, have mm-hmm. you actually, you, you visited the Netherlands. Would you consider living there? Oh, I would. She doesn't want to. Really? Oh, that's <laughs> interesting. I, I thought it would be the opposite that <laughs> yeah. she's like, please move to the Netherlands. No, no, like, she wants no. to move to the States. I don't want to move to the States. <laughs> oh. oh, well, you guys are in a perfect <laughs> still, reverse situation yeah, exactly. with each other. <laughs> right. So she's like, I, she's always like, I would love to go to the States and, li- and live there. And I'm like, but I don't think it's like, <laughs> my opinions on the United States are very different mm. now mm. that i've lived abroad and so i'm like the the workers rights the gun ownership and yeah the general distrust of each other and the divide in the united states has grown mm. specifically with social media yeah i was gonna say and so i've been thinking about like social media seems to prime people to say the most rude things that you mm-hmm. would never say to in someone you life, disagree yeah. with in your yeah. in yeah. real life if i meet an american with opposite opinions here in beijing we'll be like oh hey how's it going and mm-hmm. be amicable about it but as soon yeah. as people are online yeah. it's just they become social media very is, cruel. Is, is the worst thing that's probably happened to our society mm. our as a whole not just not just in the united states because it's everywhere like facebook mm. and youtube and all these platforms twitter it's global, mm. right? Mm. And so social media is ter- terrible for people's mental health and just for their well-being. Um, I use it every day because I'm a marketer <laughs> and I, I'm part of the I'm part of the problem. But you know, at the same time, I think it's it's a it's really terrible for people. And so in in going back to that idea of like I don't want to move to the United States right now, and I don't see that in the foreseeable future. Mm. So that's why I'm like Netherlands seems like a pretty good country, but it's kind of like the devil, you know. I know the United States. She doesn't. So everything mm. to her is new and exciting. Like, oh, I've never been to this or that. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. oh, it seems like yeah. a fun place to live. And I'm like, mm, probably, <laughs> probably not. And like, it's the same with the Netherlands. I think it's this fun, cute country where like people have claws yeah. and there's windmills and there's tulips <laughs> and like, we eat funny like snacks. And she's like, but I know the Netherlands. Yeah. Someone mm. told me they so. were going to San Francisco and I was like, okay, here's a map. This area, don't, don't go, go there. Yeah. This area, don't go there. This, uh, don't well, go I mean, there. Now, as long as you can do that you'll be great yeah i mean now <laughs> yeah. you see the videos coming out of like the homeless problem in the united states mm. and it is it's heartbreaking to be honest mm. like it has mm. gotten worse it's gotten worse in la I think it's 580,000 now yeah. yeah and you're like why can't the government just build some homes help these people yeah right and and like you know you'll you'll have plenty of interviews people talking about oh, it's very complicated trying, trying. yeah it that's what really that's what, i mean but it isn't yeah, <laughs> I, it's really complicated, but yeah, but it what, isn't. What, in, you what they do homes. in China, build homes, live here now. Yeah, okay. yeah, it's so complicated. It's, it's it's really not. You have a you have a federal budget, and it could be done Ugh. if the Congress was willing to do it. Yeah, sign it off, give them whatever billion dollars they need. I mean, we're giving aid to other countries, mm. and mm, 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 there's mm. a lot of disagreement with that. Yeah. Sign that off. Give it, give them the money, and, and put them in homes. So people, they sh- it, Americans, they should come and visit China. It's a nice place to c- come. Yeah, or I mean, the sky is black. <laughs> <laughs> I lived through the the uh, Beijing air apocalypse. That was bad. <laughs> that was 2013 and 14 was real bad. But now, no problems. Mm. Yeah, um, mm. and that's the other thing. Like uh, when when media oftentimes will make reports, they'll try and use specific clips. And mm. this is of also course. about the misinformation that's put out because now we have more blue days than we have. It's you all know, yeah, it's days, really right? lovely. I but there yeah. 
I, I want to go back to media really quickly because I noticed that in, I think it was 2020, there was a huge storm that blew off of Mongolia mm. and the sky turned orange yep. for like yes. two or three days. And you saw that on CNN. It's mm-hmm. like, ah, look, like, the sky is orange. Yeah. But then they don't show that it's blue. Every like, other day. Right after. <laughs> right after. And every <laughs> day for months yeah, afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Well, that was the thing that I noticed. Like, like when I first came to Beijing, yeah, it was real bad. But then like there was a change from the kind of central government, I think that was probably about 2014 is when they really decided things needed mm. to change. Yeah. And it took them another two years to fully implement, implement all their yeah. changes. changes. So from 2016 till now, we have more blue skies and more more mm. days that are definitely like clean air mm. and, and proper like levels of the 2.5 or whatever. And um, but you don't you don't hear that, right? Mm. Of course nobody's, not. Nobody's <laughs> going to say Beijing has cleaned up his act and Beijing's a nice place to live now. All right, can I ask you some cliche questions now? I mean, sure. All right, so what are some of your favorite foods here in China? Oh, God. Well, like I, <laughs> like I said recently, I'm not eating meat, so I'm mm. a vegetarian now. You can yeah. have most Chinese foods in a vegetarian, like with yeah, yeah, tofu. Yeah, you can. You yeah. can. You can ask. Um, but I was going to say what was going to be funny is like I actually like Chinese barbecue. So, oh, the choice. But you can have tofu, that's what mushrooms, I'm that's what mushrooms, I'm so or to- like like vegetable yeah. barbecue. So like vegetable eggplant. Yeah. Oh, their yeah. eggplant is really good. Mm. Like when they fry it on the grill. Yes. Um, and then you have like cauliflower, and you can have different types of um, mushrooms and things. Yeah. That actually, so a barbecue I actually like, even though it's not meat based. So mm. there's like tofu and different things that you can actually cook um, on the barbecue, and like the spices are really nice. So yeah. that's one of my things that I like, especially when you go out with friends because it's accommodating to other people who mm. do eat meat because then they can just have a barbecue and then mm. I can also, because some places you go and like you can ask them to take the meat out and sometimes they will, sometimes yeah. they won't depending on, and so it can get complicated if yeah. you're going out with friends. Sure, but barbecue easier, is easy. Yeah. Everybody you, can, yeah, everybody you, can. You do have, yeah, you're absolutely right. But I mean, you do have options like molotong where you yep. put your own stuff in. Of course, yeah, that's uh, good. Or you have a <laughs> hot pot, hot which pot, you yeah. can put your own things in. Yeah, yeah. You can also divide it so we're eating together. Using the small, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you get or yours, I get mine. Yeah. yeah, You can have the spicy, spicy, I'll have the less spicy. Yes. <laughs> yeah. oh. Actually, I, I used to enjoy eating the spicy because I had something to prove and now I'm like, I don't want that. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah. I, I just want this one curry or whatever like mm. yummy yeah I want the good tasting one <laughs> <laughs> not the one that's gonna burn my mouth <laughs> wow okay so uh, you have traveled to a lot of places and you did mention earlier going to Chengdu and mm. you, where are other places in China that you found resplendent <laughs> well I was gonna I was, that's what I was gonna say but then we got moving on with yeah, the conversation yeah I, I moved it um, there last uh, time like I did a proper like travel in China, I went. It was 2019, mm. and it was uh, we went to my wife and I. We went to Zhejiang, which is like um, oh, this beautiful, China. yeah, this beautiful natural like. I guess it's a park. I'm not sure. It's, I guess it's technically a park, but it yeah. like has these natural like hot spring type things, mm. uh, hot springs and pools of just like super clear water. And uh, actually, they had it shut down for a long time because there was an earthquake there. And they reopened it in 2019, and that's why we went. And uh, we did some horseback riding, and we did some camping, and we did, like, this nature walk through these, like, this area, this park. Yeah. And absolutely um, stunning. Just beautiful photos. And not too crowded because it had just reopened, Mm. so it wasn't, like, overrun. Mm. Because some tourist places can get kind of, I mean, it's... A lot of people in China. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it can get overwhelming. I think another one we went to the Avatar Mountains. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I haven't, I've never been. Yeah. And um, when we went there, it was just like wall to wall people. So you're just like, like, (laughs) it's beautiful, beautiful area, but it's hard to get the shots that you want if you're trying to make a video. Mm. And like with my wife, she's very tall. And so anytime I take her to any place outside of Beijing, people will be like Whoa. she becomes she becomes, she becomes a tourist a actor. Yeah. Well, people will run up and take pictures of her and and try and ask her stuff and she speaks chinese pretty well and mm. so like people will have conversations with her and like you're just, just soaking in the corner well i'm just like i'm trying to make a vi- <laughs> i'm trying to make a video here and these people are just can, running up let me take a that'd photo. be a great video look, um, look how my wife becomes a tourist attraction yeah yeah <laughs> my wife's a superstar <laughs> yeah it's 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 I guess it's fun my first one or two times, <laughs> <laughs> but then when it's like every time, it's like okay, I, like, can I, you stop? Yeah, can you can you stop? Because because she's new to them at that moment. Yeah. yeah. But this experience has been happening for yeah ever for the last you know, twelve years, so I, it's not new to I, us. I hear this from some foreigners too, but for some reason, I guess it's my 
egotistical n- nature. Mm. I love it when people are like, la what? I'm like, yes, <laughs> that's me. Hi. Hello. Hello. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with it, right? And, mm. and it's always done in, like, admiration and respect. Yeah, it's curiosity. never done. Yeah, it's yeah. curiosity. Like, whoa, I've just never, I've never seen, seen, seen this. Yeah. Even here, I was on the subway coming over to this interview, and a little kid just ran up and was like, "Wow!" <laughs> like, I looked down at him. I'm like, "We're in thing, Beijing. Though. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> wow!" And like, so, and then he ran back to his mom, and I was yeah. like, eh, "Whatever, it doesn't bother me." But it was still like mm. that curiosity mm. or that mm. like kind of that wow factor. Like, you've yeah. never yeah. seen uh, you know a six one blonde haired blue eye woman standing in front of you, and you're just like. Wow. Yeah, I gotta say, I you don't know. know that many of those. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, hey, I said wow when I saw her. I was like, wow, I'm gonna marry you. Uh, yeah. so, so we know who courted who. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a story for another time. Okay, please join us next time on the bridge where East meets West. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Miguel, and thank you so much, Alex. Of course, thank you, Jason. I'm super lovely meeting you. I'm definitely gonna go home and check more videos, and oh, our you. listeners probably should that should mm. do that too. Yes. Thank you.